crowds of people crammed onto the platform to get a spot on the train headed to Jackson Park, Chicago. It was May 1st, 1893. For months, the newspapers had been filled with articles about a grand event, new buildings, exciting inventions, and people from all over the world would be in Chicago, Illinois this summer. In Jackson Park, U.S. President Cleveland took his spot on the stage in front of the cheering crowd. After he gave a speech, the president walked up to the table nearest him. The table was covered with an American flag, and on top of that flag sat a golden telegraph. The president reached out his hand and pushed the telegraph key down. In doing so, an electrical current spread across 3,000 feet of wire. Fountains powered by electricity shot water 200 feet up into the air. Moments later, the crowds heard the rumble and hum of electrical machines as they sprung to life. They had never heard anything like it before. With the spark of electricity, the fair had begun. This is the story about an event that made history. An event that showed how much the world was changing during the 19th century, but also how much still needed to change. Welcome, young historians, to the Chicago World's Fair. Are you ready for another adventure to the past? I'm Brooke, the co-founder of Honest History, and in this episode, we're going to a time and place filled with imagination and creativity brought to life. Have you ever ridden on a Ferris wheel? Or have you used electricity to turn on a light bulb? Well, the Chicago World's Fair introduced the world to these incredible inventions, along with so many other incredible marvels and feats of engineering and science. Stories about the sights and sound of this particular fair would be told for years and years. In fact, many of them are still told today. That's how amazing this fair was. If you've been to a fair before, you may be imagining snack stands, rides, or farm animals and other fun exhibits you've seen there. But this fair was unlike anything in our lifetime. It even introduced famous snacks like brownies and juicy fruit gum to the world. As you listen to this episode, imagine what it was like to attend the fair. Try to imagine the sights, smells, and sounds. What would you like to go see first and why? Then, for a fun activity, try to draw out what your fair would look like if you were in charge of a future world's fair. After you listen to today's episode, go read more about this incredible event and learn about the people who made it happen. As with most famous stories from history, Many people and the ideas had to come together to create something truly incredible. But for now, let's get back to the story and travel to Chicago. World's Fair was an event that happened every few years, but some would say that the Chicago World's Fair of 1893 was the most famous. From May to October, more than 27 million people attended the fair in Chicago. New buildings were created to hold the event. The fair was given the name the White City because all the buildings in the fair were painted white. It was the place where people could show off their work to the public. They displayed music, art, inventions, and cultures from over 46 countries. In total, there were 65,000 exhibits. The different exhibits were broken up into categories like food, machinery, transportation, fine arts, and archaeology. Some of these exhibits were educational, while others were designed simply for entertainment. You could walk into the Moorish Palace and find yourself in a room filled with mirrors, You didn't know which way to go. Every step you took, you just found yourself bumping into your own reflection. At the California ostrich farm, you could see an ostrich up close. Some kids were even allowed to ride an ostrich. This exhibit was very popular. 
if you were looking for something exciting to do, you could hop aboard the captive balloon. This was the fair's most famous hot air balloon ride. But don't worry about flying away. The hot air balloon was tied to the ground with a very long rope. Next to the fair buildings, in the blue waters of Lake Michigan, sat a Viking ship. It had been built in Norway and sailed all the way to Chicago. Although visitors may have wanted to see everything, most of these exhibits were not free. A ride on the captive balloon, for example, cost more than a ticket to the fair. The fair organizers had spent a lot of money building the Chicago World's Fair, and they were desperate to make that money back. Thankfully, the fair turned out to be a huge success. By closing day, it had made more than $400,000 in profit. Back then, that was a lot of money. As soon as people entered the fair, the sounds, the smells, and the buildings made them look in every direction. They could hear piano music playing while the smell of buttered popcorn filled the air. There was one sight that captured everyone's attention. In the middle of the fair stood a towering 264-foot wheel. It was revolving around with people aboard, sending them up towards the sky and back down again. The Ferris wheel. It was the first one ever built. The Ferris wheel was named after the man who designed it, George Washington Gale Ferris Jr. Mr. Ferris had come up with the idea when the lead architect of the World's Fair sent out a challenge. Build something more impressive than the Eiffel Tower. The Eiffel Tower was a huge iron tower that had been built for the Paris Exposition in 1889. The Chicago World's Fair was America's chance to show the world what they could do. Many engineers sent in their ideas, but Mr. Ferris thought of something that no one else had imagined. I have on hand a great project for the World's Fair in Chicago, Ferris wrote. I'm going to build a vertically revolving wheel 250 feet in diameter. The Ferris wheel would become one of the most popular attractions at the fair. The giant rotating wheel had 36 carriages attached to it, and each carriage was the size of a bus. It could fit up to 60 people inside. By the end of the fair, thousands of people had taken a ride on the spinning wheel to see the fair from the sky. Although it wasn't all smooth sailing, sometimes the wheel broke down. One time, people were stuck up in the air for six hours. Could you imagine? The Ferris wheel was not the only new invention at the fair. Some of the other famous creations were juicy fruit gum, spray paint, the dishwasher, and zippers. The fair was a sight to see, but it also has a more complicated history. Officially, the Chicago State Fair was called World's Columbian Exposition. The fair opened 401 years after Christopher Columbus sailed to the Americas in 1492. The fair was meant to celebrate just how far the United States had come. But in 1893, when the fair opened, the United States still had many problems. Many people were out of work and businesses were closing. Women and Native Americans did not have the right to vote. Slavery had been abolished less than 30 years earlier, and Black Americans were still fighting for equal rights. Native Americans protested a fair that celebrated Christopher Columbus. Always was, always will be. Native Americans had contributed to American history long before he ever arrived. Indigenous people were a part of the fair, but not in the way that they would have chosen. In the middle of the fair, there was a large walkway called the Midway Palaces. This is where you could find the ostrich farm and the Ferris wheel. The fair organizers also had built villages along this walkway. There were the Irish, German, Chinese, Dahomey, Turkish, Native American, and many more villages. Native Americans performed at two different spots on this walkway, the Native American village and the Sitting Bull Cabin. 
At the Sitting Bull Cabin, a group of Ogala, Lakota, and Crow showed paying tourists parts of their culture with dances, songs, and their trades. It was a strange and unsettling experience. The Native Americans felt like they were on display, and they were. One man, Rain in the Face, grew tired and angry from these performances. Rain in the Face was a war chief of the Lakota Nation and a great war hero. He wanted Native Americans to have more control over their exhibits. He asked the fair organizers to let the Native Americans decide what they would perform. He also asked for a special day to honor his people. The fair had days to celebrate certain states, countries, and people from history. Why not a day to honor Native Americans? The fair organizers denied his request. The Native American performers earned money from their work and by posing for photographs. Like most fairgoers, many Native Americans were visitors to Chicago. They explored the city and the fair, met people from around the world, and tasted new foods like popcorn, chewing gum, and soda. During the last month of the fair, the Potawatomi chief, Simon Pokagon, gave a speech. As he stepped into the stage, he saw an opportunity to say what many Native Americans felt. He spoke about the mistreatment of Native Americans and how much they endured. The fair, he stated, should not be celebrating the arrival of Christopher Columbus. The fair had exhibits showing the achievements of many different people and places from around the world. One group of people, however, was not included in the fair, African Americans. Many were workers and speakers at the fair, but there were no buildings, no celebrations, or exhibits honoring their achievements. Black leaders like Ida B. Wells and Frederick Douglass protested. They wrote a pamphlet titled, The Reason Why the Colored American is Not in the World's Columbian Exposition. They printed this pamphlet and handed it out to visitors at the fair. The fair organizers offered to sponsor a special day for Black Americans. Wells and several other leaders did not feel that this was enough. They hesitated to participate. Frederick Douglass used this day to give a speech about race to an audience of over 2,000 people. He asked the American people to live up to their own constitution. Although the World's Fair had a message of progress, it showed just how much still needed to change. It also showed that people would fight for these changes. The fair did have one very powerful message about the future, quite literally. It had to do with the relatively new sensation of electricity. In 1893, the world was very different from the one you see today. You would have seen people riding in buggies pulled by horses, and at the same time there were trolleys and railroads. The world was changing, and nothing proved that more than electricity. For the first time at a World's Fair, electricity was given its very own building. One tourist who visited the fair exclaimed, who's not interested in the electricity building? It's exhibiting one of the greatest wonders of the many wonders of the fair. The Great Hall of Electricity was a place where people could see the new technology in action. Electric motors, telephones, lamps, and music boxes amazed visitors. The electricity building was also a place for electrical companies to show off their creations. You might have heard about an inventor named Thomas Edison. His company helped create the very first light bulb that people were able to buy and use in their homes. Inside the electricity building, Thomas Edison's tower of light dazzled spectators. This huge tower glowed with red, orange, and purple light bulbs while music played. Elsewhere in the building stood an invention that changed the world, Nikola Tesla's powerful AC generators. Nikola Tesla was an incredible scientist who had figured out a new system of creating electricity. It was called alternating current. We still use this system today to bring electricity from power stations into our homes. 
Tesla's alternating current brought electricity to the entire Chicago World's Fair. Tesla's invention was even more magnificent at night. In the evening, the white city transformed into the city of light. With the press of a button, 200,000 light bulbs began to glow using alternating current. During the six months of the Chicago World's Fair, visitors had been blown away by the power of electricity. It had been used to power the exhibits, the water fountains, and thousands of lights. For most tourists, this was the very first time that they had seen what electricity could do. The Chicago World's Fair was something people would never forget. As soon as visitors got home, people would ask them, what did you like most? But most of the time, people would reply, I saw so many things, I hardly know what I liked the most. And everything is so confused in my mind, I hardly know now what I did see. There are endless things to study from this moment in history. Historians are still finding papers and objects that visitors brought home to remember this exciting day that they spent at the fair. Young historians, there is so much to explore. I hope you will want to continue learning more about this incredible event on your own. Hi everyone, Brooke here. I loved learning about the Chicago World's Fair, and I feel like I'm always finding something new when I hear this story. So many incredible accomplishments came together at the fair, but with the good, it's also important to acknowledge the bad. Even though the event was advertised as the World's Fair, groups of people were excluded from participating or not given the opportunity to participate in a way that was meaningful for their culture. I admire Frederick Douglass, Ida B. Wells, and Rain in the Face for their bravery and demand for a positive change. I think we as Americans have come a long way since then, and I hope we continue to strive to treat others with respect, dignity, and as equals. I like to imagine how fun it would be to have a modern day World's Fair like the one in Chicago in 1893. And don't forget to get out your pencil or iPad and draw your own version of a future World's Fair. That's it for this episode. If you are interested in learning more about the Chicago World's Fair, we've got you covered. Issue 3 of Honest History Magazine, War of the Currents, is all about how Tesla powered the World's Fair with his new version of electricity. You should definitely check it out if you haven't already. See you all next time. This episode was hosted by Joanne Schinderly and written by Heidi Coburn. Production was led by Randall Lawrence. To learn more about this episode, including more about the host, visit us at honesthistorymag.com and follow along for updates on social media at Honest History.